morning, brothers and sisters. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Happy and blessed second Sunday of Advent. As we bring our praise and thanks this morning in this Advent season, we remember the birth of Jesus Christ on the earth. And at the same time, we prepare ourselves for his return. Apostle Paul already urged the Thessalonians to prepare for the return of Christ. And his advice is still valid for us today. We as Christians especially need to be mindful and not let the events going on around us get in the way of our spiritual preparation. Our relationship with Christ must remain our top priority, no matter what circumstances we face. And the question might come, how do we do this? We gain strength from the divine services, from Holy Communion, and from the fellowship with our brothers and sisters and in our prayers. In 1 Thessalonians 9, five, excuse me, in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 to 11, Apostle Paul writes, God did not set us up for angry rejection, but for salvation by our master, Jesus Christ. He died for us, a death that triggered life. Whether we're awake with the living or asleep with the dead, we're alive with him. So speak encouraging words to one another. Build up hope so you'll all be together in this. No one left out, no one left behind. I know you're already doing this. Just keep on doing it. So let's continue as Apostle Paul urged us in love, in hope, and in preparation for the day our Lord Jesus Christ will return. Wishing everyone here and connected a most blessed and beautiful morning.
In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Dear loving Heavenly Father, once more we come into your house on a Sunday morning, glad that you have taught us to set aside this time, that it is, a, it is the Sabbath day. It is the day we can set aside other thoughts and other concerns and other things in our lives and reconnect with you, that we can come together as brothers and sisters, true family, and praise you and try to put you in the right position in our hearts. But as we talked about, you are in the right position. You are our God, our, the creator of heaven and earth, the omnipotent one, our Father. Generally, Father, please help us to remember that. Help us to have a deeper relationship with you. One hour a week is not enough, dear Heavenly Father. We need to have a relationship with you in all aspects of our lives. And dear Heavenly Father, we want to come together this morning and worship you and praise you that you would even want to have a relationship with us, that you have sent your Son to save us, that our fall into sin was not the end of the story, but that you truly set in motion all the things needed for us to come back to you, to come and be welcomed to you, the righteous one, the omnipotent one. We can come to you because your Son has paved the way. Heavenly Father, we don't deserve it. Sometimes we don't even realize how little we deserve it. And yet this morning we want to come to you, bow low, bow our hearts low, humbly knowing that you are our Heavenly Father and that you love us and that we have no reason to expect so much. And dear Heavenly Father, we come hopeful that you can teach us, that you can point us to the way, you can help direct us, you can give us new hope and certainty and understanding and peace and joy into the future. Generally, Father, we want to be touched by you. We want to be enlivened by you. We want to be taught. And here we are in your house, opening our hearts to you, waiting for your word. Generally, Father, please bring it. Show us the way. Teach us the way that we can come together at the high point of the, mo of the morning to Holy Communion, that we can receive the strength to go on, the strength of your Son, that we can truly have that relationship with him and with you. Dear Holy Father, please be with us now. We set aside many things, many cares and concerns, many fears and hopes and dreams and worries about the coming days. Dear Holy Father, we lay them at your feet, that we can trust you, that we can remember that you are our Heavenly Father, and we can trust you in all things. You are already there at tomorrow. Please help us. It is all in our hearts and in our heads, but we ask you to change those things, that we can feel peace, that we can feel hope, that we can feel assurance, when by logic it might not have any reason to be there. Heavenly Father, please be with us now. Let us be able to experience an hour in heaven. Please connect our, ourselves and our hearts with those who go before us and our apostles, and above all things, please send your Son. We long to go home. Please make us worthy. This we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, my brothers and sisters, good morning. good morning. Happy to be here. This morning we have a Bible verse out of 1 Thessalonians and just two verses, the 6th and the 11th. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. Please be seated.
Thank you, choir. So, dear brothers and sisters, welcome to the second Sunday of Advent, as you, if you couldn't tell already. This morning, we hear a word from Apostle Paul. It's to the Thessalonians. They say it, he was in Corinth at the time, and he's speaking to a congregation that's well-established that he really cares for, and he's edifying them. You can read it. It's only five chapters in a very typical Paul way. He spends about three chapters getting into it, saying, good morning, how are you, and uh, this is what's going on. And, and by chapter four, he really gets into the meat and potatoes of what he wants to say. And the, the message is to be awake. And it was interesting, he speaks about awake we say in the sacristy, we wish there was more words in English because he uses awake and asleep two different ways in the same chapter. He says awake and asleep meaning alive and dead, and then he uses awake and asleep meaning with it or not with it. And here he's talking about are you with it or are you not with it? For let us not, therefore, let us not sleep as others do, let us watch and be sober. He's talking about the rapture. He's talking to the Thessalonians that there's going to be a moment that you're just one in the field, the other's taken, the other's left. He's reminding them that this moment, we have no idea when it will happen. And so he says, be awake, be with it, be with him. I say, okay. And this Advent season, what does Advent mean? I had to look it up. I thought it just meant Christmas is coming. And I said, okay, well, maybe it means waiting for the Lord. They define it as something just starting to come into view, just starting to be able to see it. And Advent season makes a lot of sense with this word. It's just starting to come into view. The Lord Jesus said the kingdom of God is at hand. He didn't mean that like it's, it might be tomorrow. He meant it's available for you today. So go grab it. It's available. So we have this, be awake, and someone's coming. And how do you not get to the story of the ten bridesmaids? The story of the ten bridesmaids is in Matthew 25. We're not going to read it, but it's the first 13 verses. And if we remember the story, this is connecting the dots with this whole theme that Lord Jesus keeps talking about of a bride and a groom. And when he spoke to the Jewish people then, he was saying all these stories that they already understood it. They already got the idea, right? He talked about how I go to prepare a place for you. Why did that make sense? Because back then, the entire generational family lived in one physical building, one farmstead. And the son would say, hey, I want to get married. I want to have a wife. And the father and son would start building an extension on the house. And only when the father said, yeah, it's ready now, go get her. And the son had no idea. He was just like, are, are we done yet? I, I, like, we have a floor, we have a wall, we're good. Oh, we need a roof? Okay, let me get a roof. And the, only the father said, okay, now go. Say, okay. Well, what's the wife doing? What's the, the fiance doing? Oh, she's waiting with her bridesmaids. Oh, okay, so now we, okay, there's the other side of the story. And the Lord Jesus is saying, well, there's these ten bridesmaids. Some are foolish, some are not. They all had oil. They all fell asleep. But ah, when the call came out that the father had said, son, go get your bride, and the, the bridegroom with his group of friends are coming, and they could just see them, the call went out, hey, he's coming, get ready. And there you go. The bridesmaids were either with it or not with it. They were awake and waiting, or they were not. Well, the story is that they were all asleep, but maybe that's uh, <laughs> not so hopeful for us. But he, the call comes out and says, hey, come. And the, the ten wise had their oil, trimmed their lamps, and went into the wedding feast. It was that sudden. And the ten foolish went and got oil, came back, and knocked on the door. 
The door had already been closed. And this is the 11th verse. Afterwards, the other virgins came also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Pretty harsh, right? But it was, it was interesting. I was thinking about that for this morning. Like, if the Lord Jesus had to tell this story today, I think he'd be using cell phones. What well, not oil lamps. Like, everybody was zombie on their phone, like I am in the morning and at night, and while I walk from one room to the room, when is the phone not attached to my hand, right? And the Lord says, are you awake? Oh, well, the call came out, but it wasn't a cell phone call, it was an audible call. Did you have your earphones in or your earphones out? And the Lord says, are you, did you hear? And you walk up to the wedding feast like, oh, I, 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 I want to get in. How could he lock the door? Who is this? How could he possibly lock the door? It's a wedding. It's like we don't know him at all. Aha, yeah. It's like you don't know him at all. That, my dear brothers and sisters, is the story, is the point the Lord Jesus is trying to make. He's like, you have to know me. You have to know. This is what Paul is saying. You have to be awake. You have to be alive. You have to be with it. So how do we get to know him? Lots of, lots of ways, I think. This is a good one. Coming into the Lord's house, hearing him speak, hearing his message for us. But is an hour a week enough? Those who have kids, is an hour a week teaching them and talking with them and having a relationship with them enough? If you can get that when they're a teenager, go for it. But I think you need a little bit more. Is it enough between a man and a wife? To between two in a relationship? Is it enough one hour a week? Not really. It's not deep enough. It's, not, it's, it's the superficial stuff. How was your day? And you kind of wipe all that away and say, well, when was the meat and potatoes? When was the relationship building stuff actually happening? Because it usually takes some time. You gotta get, gotta get through the how was your day? It was bad, it was good. Blah, blah. You get into how are you feeling? How can I help? Oh, uh, Tell me more. I want to hear more. And we get to create an understanding of who that person is when we have a relationship with them. How do we do that with our Heavenly Father? You might say, well, it's not the same way I do with anyone else I come into contact with. I can sit down and we can talk. And I can hear what they have to say. With God, it's a little bit different. He's already set up and established so much for us that we have at our fingertips. Say, well, we should probably read the Bible a little bit. We should know what he said, what he's said before. Okay, we could do that. That's a good habit to be in. And I thought about meditation. Of course, prayer comes up, right? We need to pray. We should pray to our Heavenly Father. And we teach the kids in Sunday school a tip, adoration, thanks, intercession, petition. You should start your prayer with adoration. You should then go to thanks. Then you can intercede for each other. And at the very end, you can petition for some things for yourself. It's like, well, we read the, the, the Lord's Prayer. The whole first half is just adoration, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. And then there's a little petition. Give us just today what we need. Not tomorrow, just today. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, right? Back to adoration. And we say, wow, that's, that's quite a bit. I don't, even have, I don't have enough words for that. Say, God, you're great. This is what I'm worried about. And sometimes we get into that. I can tell you. Maybe I'm showing too much of what my prayer life looks like. We say, well, what if we looked at it differently? What if we said meditation? I don't think we use that word a lot in Christianity. We don't talk about meditation. <clears throat> but it was, it was interesting. I, I was listening to something about meditation, and one of the things they said was, just focus on your breathing. It's called mindfulness. You can Google it. If you think about your breathing... And just think about this, 20 minutes a day. Stop, turn off everything, close your eyes, 
just think about your breathing. Do you think you can make it 30 seconds? Breathing, the one thing that we don't have to think about. The one habit, the one thing that happens automatically. It happens when we talk, it happens when we sleep. And we're saying, think about that? And they say, why do you do that? Well, because if you can focus on your breath, you can focus on anything. Oh, okay. Maybe there is some value in that. So let's swap breath for our relationship with our Heavenly Father. If you can focus on your relationship with your Heavenly Father, then you can focus on it at any time. You can focus on it and you can remember it when you need it. You can remember that our Heavenly Father is our Father when we need it. And it, it might start to come naturally. They talk about this mindfulness because it, it kind of pushes everything else to the side. I can remember what I'm thinking about. I can notice a distraction when it comes into my mind. I can say, oh, I, I'm supposed to be on task right now. I'm supposed to be over here, not thinking about this other thing. And suddenly, you have more ability to be aware of where your mind's at, what you're thinking about. Wouldn't it be nice if we could do that with our hearts and say, wow, I am not acting trustful, very trusting right now in my Heavenly Father. This worry that is hanging on me is clearly showing me that I'm not very trusting right now. I'm not feeling it. I'm not in the moment. And this is what Paul is saying. Are you awake? Are you alive? Or are you asleep like others do? You say, okay, well, how do I get there? Well, I think maybe some prayer, some meditation, some thinking about our relationship with him, some getting to know him, so that we can knock on the door and say, Lord, it's us. And he goes, oh, yeah, I know you. We talk every morning. You're thinking about me all the time. I know you. There's a saying for young people, don't meet your heroes. They say, don't meet your heroes. Why? Because they'll disappoint you, right? You go and you build up this idea of who they are, and they're not such nice people. They're such wonderful people, sports figure, TikToker, who, whoever it is. And you say, wow. Well, they say awesome things, and then you meet them, and uh, things start to shake a little bit. Because that's what we do. We actually create an understanding of that person in our heads, so we can actually simulate what they would say and how they would act and what their thinking is. That's what we do. It's just inherently in who we are as human beings. You think about your great aunt Sue. If you know your great aunt Sue, then you would know what she might say to a particular question. That's just what happens. Well, as we interact more with our heroes, we start to say, oh, this is what they'd say. But then we meet the hero, and they say the opposite. And then everything starts to shake. And we say, oh, they're not who I thought they were. And our, our whole foundation starts to shake a little bit. But here, this is the one hero you should meet. Our Heavenly Father and the Lord Jesus, this is the one hero we should actually get to know and meet and have a deep relationship with, have a deep conversation with. What are some things we should know about him? Well, one, I think Paul said it. He sent his son to die for you because he loves you. I think we know that one. We know that he loves us and he cares for us and he died to take our sin away and put us back onto the path. The chief of Basel just talked about this idea that the fall into sin, this man has to labor for his, his food, and women have to have pain in childbirth from back at Genesis. This was not the Lord saying, ah, this is what I want. This was, well, they sinned. This is the separation that happens now. This is the effect. Okay. Knowing that our Heavenly Father is not necessarily our Heavenly Grandfather, as our Apostle Schnabel once put it. Sometimes we think that, yeah, but he loves me. He loves, he's going to let me into the wedding feast, right? He's going to open that. I was late, I get it. I was asleep. I missed the call. I came over, knocked on the door. He's going to open it for me. Come on, it's me. 
he's going to love me no matter what I do, even if I don't connect with him at all. Oh, he's going to love me even if I pray to him for the first time, for real, for the first time in a long, long time, and he's going to connect with me, and he's going to tell me exactly what to do. I'm going to have this feeling in my heart, and I'm going to know what to do. He's going to do that for me, right? He's our Heavenly Father, not our Heavenly Grandfather. Our Heavenly Father is there for you. He's there to have a relationship with you. He's there to connect with you and talk with you. But you've got to have this back and forth. He has to know you're listening. He has to have this connection with you. So there's a couple of things we can know about him. We talked with the youth once. You want to know God? You want to know who he is? You want to know the Lord Jesus? You have to read this book. It's long. Read the back half first, then the front half. The back half talks about what the front half is saying. You've got to read the New Testament, kind of understand the story of Jesus and all that he says, and then you kind of know what all these prophets were talking about. And that's helpful. We wanted to like get him engaged a little bit. He said, you know, you ever feel like you don't belong? You ever feel like, you know, nobody's nobody's there to help you? Nobody's there to that knows what you're going through. You're like one in a million. It's uh, this situation is completely foreign to anyone else. There's no one I can talk to. You know what's awesome? The Lord Jesus, well, I would say our Heavenly Father made this happen just so that the fir- one of the first people who are baptized as a Christian in the scriptures is an Ethiopian eunuch. So an Ethiopian eunuch means, well, he's not Jewish. Doesn't look like a Jewish person either. He's not everything a man is supposed to be, so he can't become a Jew. So he not only can't become a Jew, but he can't become what they called a proselyte, which was a convert. He wasn't allowed. The rules said, no, can't go past here. You can act like it. You can maybe will kind of like let you listen in. But no, you can't come into the temple. You can't do these things. You just can't. Sorry, you just can't. And he's on a cart reading Isaiah, and Philip sees him. Philip goes, you know what you're reading? He goes, no, nobody will tell me. How am I supposed to know if nobody can teach me? You know why nobody could teach him? Because he couldn't get in the temple. You know why he couldn't get in the temple? Because of nothing he did. Because of where he was born, who he was, what happened to him as a, as a young, young one. Nothing he did. You ever feel like, ugh, I'm, I'm being locked out? Nobody gets me? This guy is reading Isaiah, a Jewish Torah, trying to understand it alone on his way from city to city, and Philip finds him and explains it all to him. He's like, ah, how it makes sense. And the Ethiopian's like, what would stop me from being baptized right now? He says, nothing, let's go. They went down to the river, he's baptized, and goes on his way. Those stories like this are littered inside the the New Testament and the Old Testament. These stories of who our Heavenly Father really is, who he is for us. He will find you even when you are locked out of everything in the world that you want to get into. Say, I want to have a relationship with you. I want to figure out how to have a relationship with you. I want to understand, like, even where to start. But it feels like everything is a barrier. I don't know how to have a relationship with you. I know how to have a relationship with my spouse or my kids or my friends. I can just sit down and talk with them. I'm hearing that we're supposed to be awake. What is that like? I don't understand. Nobody's here to teach me. My Heavenly Father says, ah. I'll take care of it. Dear brothers and sisters, we have to get to know him. We have to understand who he is. Then we can say, ah, now I'm awake. And if we are, if we do get to know him, we get to know who our Heavenly Father is in our lives, who he is to us, a couple of things happen. 
It changes who we are. It changes how we act. I was looking in my notes from previous services, and all I had was the date and act like you trust him. Nothing else. I didn't get who was holding service, what the service was about. The only thing I had was act like you trust him. That was, <laughs> that was quite a message. Can you act like you trust him? This mindfulness idea, this idea that we kind of get to know ourselves and get to know how we're feeling and how we're thinking. and You kind of start to analyze how you are during the day, or at least I do. And I look back and say, you're not even faking it. You're not even trying to act like you trust him. You are worried about every little thing. Say, act like you trust him. If you know him, then that becomes a bit easier. What else do we do? We act like we love him. We love him and we love our neighbor. Why? Because God created them too. They're the creation. They're just as unworthy, and yet accepting of grace and love and to be with him forever. Okay, so we know him. All right, fine, I have to love like you love. I have to see that everyone else is also his child. Another one. The service was about loving. A Christian is loving. And we talked all about how we should act, love, love, love. And I kept thinking how much effort I put into finding the right thing to say, the correct thing, the fair thing, how in this interaction I have to be fair, I have to be balanced, I have to be correct. Because if somebody else hears, then they'll want the same thing. And it has to be how much of that at work happens. Oh, I cannot let you get PTO. You asked for the time off 13 days before, not 14. The rule says 14. Sorry, that's the rules. Got to be fair. Got to be equitable. Got to be equal across the board. And how much of our effort goes into that idea, even in our regular interactions? And the Lord says, be loving. Well, finding the loving thing is a lot easier. It's a lot less stressful. What is the loving thing to do in this situation? What's the loving thing to do in that situation? Think about the most difficult situation you have coming up. You say, well, I have to be right. It's the client. It's my customer. It's the student. Like, I, I, it has to be right. What if it was just the loving thing? Suddenly, maybe a, a path forward starts to take, take clarity. You, you start to see how you could go forward. And the worry comes back in, oh, but if I'm loving to them, I have to be loving to them. Well, it's a different situation. But yeah, you've got to be loving to them too. Finally, what else changes? We know him, so we act like we trust him. We act like we love him. We remember that life is not a solo sport. We can't go through life with just this one-on-one. -on -one. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to block everything else out, and now I am going to meditate 24 hours a day. I'm going to connect only with him. I'm going to love him, and I'm going to have a really great relationship with him. So that doesn't work either. So the life as a solo sport doesn't work out too well. We have to be together. We are brothers and sisters. We are neighbors. We are those who come and worship together. The chief apostle just said something interesting. He said... It's not about being in the church building even so much. He goes, it's not. Coming into church is the effect of having a relationship with him, not the cause. You can't have one hour a week and have a relationship. It doesn't work. You can't make anyone have faith. Sorry, parents. Wouldn't that be nice? If we can make our kids have faith. It doesn't work. It's actually... Completely polar opposite. If you try to push, it doesn't work. you got to let go. But 
We say, well, we want them in the church building. We want them here. Please come, come to church. We get them here to church. Okay, great. Ah, uh, yes, listen to service. What, what are we doing? We say, and the chief apostle said something interesting. He goes, we can't fall into this idea, this mindset of out of sight, out of mind. They are still our brothers and sisters. I thought that was interesting. Go reach out, even on a Tuesday afternoon. Send those texts. Phones are good, I promise. They can be bad, but they can be really, really good too. Send those texts. Stay connected with each other. And that's what he, uh, be awake, be alive, be connected with me. Because if you're connected with me, then you see the relationship you want to have with your brothers and sisters. Then nothing goes out of sight, out of mind, because they're your brother and sister. It doesn't matter if they moved across the country, they're still your brother and sister. It doesn't matter that they're not in church on Sunday, because they're still your brother and sister. Does that mean we check up on them? Where were you? Where were you on Sunday? We say, how are you? Maybe that's a better way to start. Dear brothers and sisters, it's very important that we hear what the Apostle Paul is saying. Be awake. Have a relationship with me. Then these things start to happen. We start to act like we trust him, act like we love him, and see our neighbor, see our brothers and sisters as those we can touch and say, hey, have you heard this thing I've heard? Come, come, read this thing we call the Bible. There's a whole bunch of really awesome stories that really explain who he is to us. Amen. Amen. So we have an acceptance hymn, the congregation, and we've asked Deacon Eprecht to continue the service. Good morning. Good morning. This morning, the Holy Spirit, he brought us on a journey as to our preparation for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the message was clear. Be awake. And though there are so many different words that were brought out that represents that idea of being awake, Paul very clearly in 1 Thessalonians mentions two elements that we can build into. One of them is this idea of watching and waiting. This will help us be awake. And the second is this idea of comforting and edifying those around us. And these two ideas, where they might seem separate in their own senses, they're inherently connected. And if we actually look in the Bible, like we heard, these stories are littered throughout, all the way back in the Old Testament in Joshua we hear about how this idea of watching and waiting and edifying those around us, how they're connected. In the beginning of Joshua, it talks about how at this point Moses has passed away and the commission of bringing the Israelites to the promised land is given to Joshua. And Joshua takes the Israelites and he enters into the land of Canaan and they reach the Jordan River. 
Upon reaching the river, he commands the priests to take the Ark of the Covenant, and as soon as their feet touch the river's edge, the river stops in the presence of the manifestation of his power and his law and of his glory, the Ark. And as they continue on, the Israelites reach the city of Jericho. And we know the story of the city of Jericho. The Lord comes to Joshua and says, over the course of seven days, do what I say. And on the seventh day, the walls will fall and the city will be yours. And it is interesting to note that the Israelites were not simply told, ah, on the seventh day, the walls will fall. Congratulations, the city is yours. No. The Lord gives the Israelites direction in their waiting for that seventh day. And this we actually know, and it is detailed. We know how the Lord tells them to march around the city. But he does so in a very interesting manner. If we read in Joshua 6, verses 8 and 9, the Lord says, So it was when Joshua had spoken to the people that the seven priests, bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Lord, they advanced and blew the trumpets. And the ark of the covenant of the Lord followed them. The armed men went before the priests who blew the trumpets, and the rear guard came after the ark while the priests continued blowing their trumpets. It's interesting to note, the Lord could have looked at the Israelites and said, oh, on the seventh day the walls will fall. He could have taken the ark, put that in front of the walls. It stopped the Jordan River, the power, the law, that manifestation. Being that it could stop rivers, why could it not bring down these walls? But the Lord is very clear. In this watching and waiting for the seventh day, the Israelites were to set the armed men first, then the priests, then the ark, then the rear guard. And how interesting the Lord does this. In that if you were an Israelite looking at those walls, how large and how tremendous and how intimidating they might have been, that looking to their left and to their right, looking in front of them, seeing the armed men, and looking behind them, seeing the ark, and more rear guard, how they were edifying and comforting and encouraging one another in that waiting for that seventh day. And it's interesting to note as well that this imagery that the Lord gives us in Joshua, it actually parallels very nicely with our Advent season. We know as we come to the end of November and wintertime approaches here in New York, that by the last Thursday, that Christmas time is coming. And we have December 25th to look forward to. And we start pulling out our festive pajamas, and we start preparing our playlists. And we might start to defrost, perhaps, or start to thaw out our potentially colder New York dispositions. But it's interesting to note even though Christmas is on December 25th, what happens if Christmas were not on a set date? What happens if throughout the course of the year, we would wait and then we'd find randomly, oh, the Christmas is coming, it's here now. I would venture to say we would have some disorientation and we need to get used to exactly what's going on. But brothers and sisters, I would venture to say we would need to recalibrate. We would need to recalibrate the way that we prepare, seeing forward for that day, the way we watch and wait for it, as well as the way that we treat our neighbors during that Christmas time and in our building up and comforting of each other. And we know that Christmas is on December 25th every year. But as we know that date is coming and we watch for it, we should also have demarcated in our heart and souls the coming of the Lord. That date should be demarcated in our heart and souls, even though we do not know when it is. And in doing so, we can be watching and waiting for it, as well as edifying and comforting our brothers and sisters in that column of the Lord, just as Joshua and the Israelites did. Amen. So, my dear brothers and sisters, as we prepare for Holy Communion, we have to remember that we don't really know Him. We don't all the way know our Heavenly Father. And we don't deserve the fact that He has a relationship with us at all. 
is there anyone else in the world you could walk up to and say, hey, I want to have a relationship with you, like, forever, and you don't know them at all, and they say, sure. I can tell you, it, it doesn't, uh, guys, it doesn't work with the ladies. It, you, you need to start some other interaction first. You need to communicate a little bit. They get to know you. You get to know them, blah, 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 okay. Does it take seven days? No. Does it take seven years? No. Somewhere in between seven days and seven years, we can develop a relationship. But our Heavenly Father knows you even if you don't know him. And you can come to this moment and say, yeah, I totally messed up, uh, totally been sleeping, haven't been awake, and the call is going out, and I heard it, and I showed up. Can I come in? And the answer is yes. The answer is yes, because you heard the call, and you came. This might be frustrating for others that heard the, were, were awake the whole time, waiting. We say, well, don't I get something special? Don't I have something extra? No, there is nothing extra. What could you possibly want more than to be with God for all time and eternity in a close relationship with him? So who else could we come to saying, I don't know you, I haven't done what you've asked me to do, I haven't done the things you've called me to do, I haven't been even awake enough to know it, but I just woke up, and I want to come to you now. And I feel sorry for some of the things, haven't really thought enough about all the things, but I want to come to you now. That works with him, somehow. That works with him. doesn't work with anybody else, I don't think. Not that I've tried everybody, but I don't think it works. I don't think you can go up to anyone and say, I want to have a relationship with you forever, but I, this okay? This moment, this time of Holy Communion, can't be the only time we think about this. Can't be the only time we reflect and say, I really don't know him enough, and I have been sleeping. But we have to. We have to find some time to look at our lives and remember that our Heavenly Father welcomes us to this moment to have Holy Communion, to get the strength from Him, to have a relationship with His Son, even when we fail. He wants to have a relationship with us as sinners, even though we turned our back on Him, even though we've fallen into sin. He wants to fix this separation we've created between us. And he's established everything necessary for us to do that. Feel the forgiveness of sins that our Lord Jesus Christ gives us. Come for Holy Communion, wanting a relationship with him, and take that bread and wine and remember him. And don't remember him just today. Don't remember him just while you're in your nice fancy dress, remember him all the time. You might also say meditate on him all the time. Think about him all the time. Because he accepts you just the way you are. He doesn't want you to stay just the way you are. That's a very different thought. You're not allowed to stay just the way you are. You have to change. You have to progress. But he accepts you today just the way you are. Dear brothers and sisters, that's what it means to come for Holy Communion, to remember that we don't know him, but we want to be with him. Amen.
So let us rise and pray the Lord's Prayer together. And we pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In the commission of my Senator the Apostle, I proclaim unto you the glad tidings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, and the communion of the whole, the Son of the living God, your sins are forgiven. The peace of the risen one abide with you. Amen. Amen. Dear loving Heavenly Father, we give thanks that we could come and worship you. We give thanks that you have spoken to us. We give thanks that you have sent your Son, that we could have this forgiveness of sins, and that we could have this relationship with him, and characterize it and remember it through the Holy Communion, that we can receive the Holy Communion to have strength for the future, to have a connection with him, to be able to change and be like him. You said, behold, I make all things new. Dear Holy Father, please make us new. Change us so that we can truly live this way, that we can be awake, we can be waiting for you, we can get to know you, that we know your voice. It is a still, small voice, a quiet voice, a voice we have to quiet other things to hear. But dear Holy Father, let us quiet them. Let us hear your voice. Let us hear what you have to say to us, that we can be changed. We can have hope. We can have peace. We can have assurance. And we can have strength for the future. Please be with us now. This we ask and pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And now we shall celebrate Holy Communion. Now the Lord's table is prepared. In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I consecrate bread and wine for Holy Communion and lay there upon the once brought, eternally valid sacrifice of Jesus Christ. For the Lord took bread and wine, gave thanks, and said, This is my body, which is broken for you. This is my blood of the new covenant, given for many for the remission of sins. Eat and drink. Do this in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this wine, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Amen. Amen. Body and blood of Jesus given for you. Amen. Congregation may be seated. The Lord now invites you to come forward for Holy Communion.
Let us rise and close with a prayer. Dear loving Heavenly Father, once more we say thank you. Glad that we could come into your house this morning. Glad that we could experience the, a moment of worship with our brothers and sisters. Glad that we can experience your love and your dedication to us. We likewise want to be dedicated to you. Dear Heavenly Father, we bring our offerings. Please cover them. Let them serve to further your work. We think of those who carry heavy crosses, fears for the futures, fears for what tomorrow may bring, doctor's appointments, tests, problems at work. Dear Heavenly Father, cover all things. Let us know that while your focus is on our, et our eternal life, you also care for even the small things that we can see your hand in our lives, even in these small things, that we can see that somehow, for some reason, you, the omnipotent one, the God of all things, care about our lives. Generally, Father, let that stay with us. Let us stay in our hearts that we can see it. Not that you change these things that we wish for, not that you come and make a, a large show of things and, and change things the way we would want them to be and bring down the walls of Jericho because they should be done this way. But dear Holy Father, we can hear the still small voice. We can hear it in our brothers and sisters communication. We can hear it in the sermon. We can read it in the Bible. We can hear it in our hearts that you love us. Dear Holy Father, please let that stay with us let it uplift us, let it strengthen us, that we can tackle and, and go, go into the future uplifted and strengthened. Be with us now. Co cover us with the angel of protection and let us have a wonderful week ahead and a wonderful Advent season that we can come focused on the future, focused on Christmas Day, but more importantly, focused on what the day you send your son. Please be with us now and into the coming days. This we ask and pray. In Jesus' name, amen. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Please be seated. I think we have a choir and congregational hymn. We're only four minutes over, so.
So we have a number of announcements for this morning. I'm tethered to my phone. That's where they are and in my hand. So see, I was listening during service. There you go. Um, it's with great sadness that we share with you the passing of our dear friend and sister, Elaine Fent. She is survived by her sister, Linda, three children, John, Jim, and Terry, nine grandchildren. The funeral will take place here in our Woodbury congregation Saturday, that's next Saturday, coming up December 10th at 11 a.m. The funeral service will begin. <clears throat> Excuse me. There will be refreshments to follow after the service. In lieu of flowers, the family encourages those that are interested to make a donation in Elaine's memory to the Olivia Hope Foundation. Uh, there's some information that came in an email, <clears throat> excuse me again, related to that. And if you have any questions on that, um, then just ask one of the ministers or ask Janice and we can get that information to you. Please continue to keep the entire family in your prayers during that time. The funeral service will be transmitted via web for those unable to attend, and our conference bridge hopefully will be working. We had some issues. If anyone stayed on and was able to hear now, you'll understand why you did not get the beginning of service because we had trouble with some of our equipment here. Always as a reminder, don't take it for granted that things work. Choir doesn't take for granted now that the lights work up in the loft because we have some problems. So pray for all of that. Uh, we would like to say thank you to everyone who helped decorate last Sunday. Looks great. We really and truly appreciate your help. Next Sunday, we will have our children's Christmas worship here in Woodbury. That will take place before service begins. After the service, we're going to have our Christmas dinner in the fellowship hall. Please feel free to bring a dessert to that. Also next Sunday, which is the 11th, is the last day to bring items for the Syracuse family. And we would also like to do the Christmas cheer gift baskets for our seniors again, like we did last year. Uh, Missy is going to be back at the coffee bar after service to take names of those who would like to volunteer to help with that. Please see her in the back. And for those that have joined us on the web, I'm gonna ask inside if we can switch to camera two, which is over my shoulder here. And everyone in this center section here, you can wish our friends who are joining us a happy Advent season. And then we're gonna to switch to camera three, which is above the piano, and ask those in front of the sacristy if you can give a wave as well to our friends that have joined us. And of course, we don't want the choir, even though you got some show time already. Back to this camera here, you can wave hi to everybody. Thank you all for being here today. Have a great rest of your day. Oh, oh, one more thing, thank you, thank you. See, holding too many things here. We have a thank you card to read from the Denneke family. Dear brothers and sisters, Monfort and I want to thank our dear church family with all our hearts for attending our 50th anniversary celebration. Thank you for your kind wishes, gifts, and cards. You added so much happiness to our special day. We feel so loved. Thank you again for making our anniversary most memorable. With love and gratitude, Monfred and Suzanne Denneke. Thank you.